Good morning, everyone. Yes. Uh, welcome to the Transportation and Infrastructure Subcommittee. Uh, we will be joined, um, Councilwoman Gallego and I will be joined by Laura Pastor, Vice Mayor, on the phone. I think she's there? Yes. Okay. Yes. And then Councilman Valenzuela will be joining us later by phone. Uh, calling the meeting to order, and I want to say there are corrections to the minutes, I understand, to be done at another time, and so we want to hold those to the next meeting. Yes, Madam Chair, uh, thank you. Uh, we, we did find some errors in the, in the minutes that we'd like to correct and hold until the next meeting. Very good. We don't need a motion on that, though, do we? No. Yeah. I don't think so. Next items, uh, two through eight, are consent items. Does anyone have any questions or comments? If not, do I have a motion? I will move approval and just note that we continue to work uh, with Maricopa County on more funding for flood control. There are several flood control items at a good meeting with uh, one of the county supervisors yesterday because we still have so much more work to do and this is just a drop in the bucket of, of the work we need to do as we saw again with this monsoon season. But with that, I move approval. Very good. Vice Mayor, do you have any questions? No, I have a second. Okay, we have a motion and a second. All in favor, please say aye. Aye. Motion carries. Items 9 through 11 are for information only. Does anyone uh, need a staff report or more information at this time? I just, on the T2050 performance measures, would love to see if we could have one for street sign replacement, which is of interest to people in my district. They would love to see progress towards replacing those street signs with ones that are easy to read. And I, there was some news coverage as well that it is not just my district that is interested in that particular item. They're pretty sad. They're <laughs> we, have, uh, we have opportunity to improve in that particular. <laughs> okay. Uh, hearing none, we will go to item 12, which is the downtown light rail guideway and station configuration. Yes, Madam Chair, uh, thank you. Uh, here to present on, on this item is Albert Santana, Director of High Capacity Transit. He's joined by Maria Hyatt, Public Transit Director, and Ray Dovalina, Street Transportation Director, who have all helped and, and worked together to bring this uh, proposal for, uh, for the downtown light rail connection. So I'll turn it over to Albert for the presentation. Uh, thank you, Mario and uh, Chair Williams, members of the subcommittee. We are uh, very excited to bring you this item. We think that this is something that really helps to build upon um, not only future of the investments that we're making in transportation and in all modes of transportation, but something specifically that is going to hopefully help support the, the positive momentum and the future uh, development and activity in, in the downtown Phoenix area and, and how transportation can play a vital role to support that momentum. So this, uh, this presentation, uh, really gets to speaking to that. And as you all know, uh, we've had lots of great things going on in downtown Phoenix with lots of people uh, moving into the core part of the city, uh, lots of jobs being created. Of course, the, uh, the success we've had in, in major special events with Super Bowl and the NCAA Final Four and college football championships and many special events, as well as lots of economic development. And, and we know that in transportation, uh, that transportation is a key part of keeping those uh, events coming into the Phoenix area, as well as keeping uh, people's uh, ability to, to, to relocate, work, and live in downtown. So with that in mind, um, we began to, to look at and, and, and working with, uh, led by our mayor's office, as well as with staff from the city of Phoenix and Valley Metro, is with the approval of the Phoenix Transportation 2050 back in August 2015, Several of things happened specifically from a light rail perspective in that we were able to accelerate some of our future corridors, uh, beginning with South Central. We were able to accelerate that project from 2034 to 2023, as well as our extension that would be going out to the Metro Center Mall area, moving that from 2026 also to 2023. And then we had a planned extension that would get out towards the state capital area also by 2023. And as you see on the slide there, with all arrows pointing to 2023, We've got a lot of things planned from a light rail perspective, um, specific that all kind of culminate in the downtown area. But this presentation isn't just about light rail, and that's why uh, Maria Hyatt and, and Ray Dovalina are here to, to lend their support. Uh, they've been a, a key part in their respective areas in what we're presenting today. Because as we started to think about all of these extensions coming off of our main line that we've now had in operation since 2008, 
we wanted to make sure that we were looking at this from, from all different modes and how we could make sure that we're maximizing our connectivity because in the city of Phoenix, unlike other major, major metropolitan areas, we don't have a natural union station or a major area where all trains can come in and all trains can go back out to those respective lines. And also we wanted to make sure that as this um, investment in light rail was coming into the core part of our city that we weren't having uh, major tra traffic disruptions for the individuals in auto, as well as we wanted to make sure that we didn't have major operational issues with light rail because we do have one-way couplets because we have a lot of one-way streets in downtown. And then again, um, the no transfer hub or a natural place for transfer hub could also then kind of pigeon off into the fact that we don't want to inconvenience our passengers. So if we have people coming in from our new extension in South Phoenix or from Metro Center, that as they did come into downtown and let's say they needed to get to the Capitol or they needed to get to the airport or to another place along the extension, and they had a difficult time transferring, that night might encourage individuals to keep using those extensions, which we know are great investments. So with those great opportunities and with those challenges in mind, we really wanted to take a step back and figure out how can we do all of this work and do it in a way that creates an environment for efficient transfers as well as supporting the experience for our passengers. So this map here gives you um, a vision of what our system will potentially look like in the year 2023. So the red line would show you kind of an east-west type of an extension that would go from the East Valley at Gilbert in Maine, which is an extension being worked on now, out west towards the state capital area. The green line would show you the north-south connection, which would be from as far south as central and baseline up to the Metro Center Mall. The blue lines there represent the Tempe streetcar, which is under construction now. The circle in the middle is what we're talking about, this intersection where all of our light rail extensions all come together and have this perpendicular crossing. So the next slide is a graphic that shows you what light rail looks like today in downtown with our extensions coming down Washington and Jefferson and then north and south on Central and First Avenue. The white boxes there show where our existing stations are at, uh, right in front of Cityscape on First Avenue and Jefferson, as well as on Central and Adams. And then of course our two stations by the uh, Central Station and then a station serving our sports arena complex and then a station near our Symphony Hall. So with our first extension, which is going into Central City South and South Phoenix, we do have the lines coming in on Central and First Avenue. But one thing you quickly realize is that we are not at this point in the existing plan adding any stations into the downtown. We are adding very important lines that do connect communities that need transportation. But we're, from a downtown perspective, we're not adding any stations. And then when we look out a little further in the future, the red line, bless, bless you. you. The, the red line represents the extension going from the downtown area out west towards the state capitol. Now this extension has two planned stations near the areas of 3rd Avenue in Washington and 3rd Avenue in Jefferson. So as we started looking at all of these lines, while from an independent perspective they might work for their corridors, but as they all culminate in the downtown area, we quickly started to realize from a passenger experience perspective if an individual, for example, wanted to go from the warehouse district and make a commute out to the airport, which we know through modeling, that's going to be a use, they would have to come up to around the Central and Adams station and then make a multi-block commute to the station near First Avenue and Jefferson and hope that they know that that's the right extension to get them over to the airport. Or, for example, if you wanted to go from the capital and get back to your home in, let's say, Central City South or South Phoenix, on that extension, you would get off on 3rd Avenue and the existing plan, get off on 3rd Avenue and Jefferson and then have to walk three blocks to get to the next station to be able to take that commute to the south. So that's some of the stuff that really started to get our wheels turning as to how can we make sure that we're not forcing passengers to do these multi-block walks, especially in, with one, we don't want passengers not getting to the right extension. And two, we want to make sure that we have easy transfers, especially when we have warm times of the year. The other piece that the next slide will show is that all of these extensions are showing alignments going up Central Avenue. So when you're coming from the Capitol, there would be a left-hand turn onto Central Avenue. We have our existing alignment. We utilize the Central Avenue. And then the South Central Corridor also proposes a North-South using Central Avenue. 
So what does that mean? That, that would mean that we'd be having trains possibly on Central Avenue running about every one to three minutes. And so when you start looking at some of our heavily used arterial streets that are giving east-west traffic, we might have some major disruptions for the, from the automobile perspective, especially if you look at streets like Van Buren, McDowell, Thomas, Osborne, all the way up to Camelback. So again, this just gave us more reason as to how we need to take a step back and figure out now that we've got this great opportunity, we're in final design for South Central, we'll soon be in final design for the Metro Center Mall. Let's really start looking at how we can make sure that we're trying to propose some solutions to that. The, this slide here kind of zooms in to the core of, of this issue, which shows uh, how the system would look if we made no modifications to these extensions coming into downtown. If you notice, on Jefferson, as you're heading eastbound, we're looking at a left turn or 90 degree angle turn onto Central Avenue through the middle of Cityscape, which would cross three through traffic lanes of, uh, for vehicle traffic. It also would have South Central coming through that intersection, so you'd have lots of trains crossing there. We have a similar dynamic at First Avenue and Washington with trains coming southbound straight through the intersection, which currently happens today. But then with the extension, we would also have a left turn with, again, crossing through three traffic of lanes. The one piece that we quickly realized was missing is that in order for us to have a true north, south, east, west type of a system is that we would need to add tracks where they're missing, which is along Washington Street uh, between Central and First Avenue. So two things happened here. By adding in these tracks, not only do we give ourselves flexibility to have a, a multi-line system, for example, an A train that goes east-west and a B train that goes north-south, but it also gives us the ability to eliminate those 90 degree turns. So you know, now you see on this graphic here that we now have the ability for the three through traffic lanes for vehicle to no longer have the disruption of trains making those very slow turns at Central and Jefferson, as well as at First Avenue and Washington Street. And working with Ray's team in the Street Transportation Department, that's a very important factor for us to keep those through uh, traffic lanes moving as fast as possible because Washington and Jefferson are very highly used uh, roads for people coming in and out in downtown via, via car. So then we got to thinking, well, if we're gonna add the tracks there, and then we're talking about the passenger's experience to be able to move from one line to the next, that if we're gonna add the tracks there, why not start thinking about an opportunity where we can maybe allow people the, the, ch the chance to get off and on at a station. So now, if you're coming from the East Valley or from the airport and you wanna get to your home in Central City South or to your place of business, you can now, instead of having to get off on Third Avenue in Washington and walk back a couple of blocks, why not relocate that station from Third Avenue in Washington and propose putting it here right in this hub at First Avenue in Washington. So now you'd be able to get off at First Avenue in Washington and make an easy transfer by simply going across the street and then heading south. And so with, with that in mindset, we started looking at, well, what if you're coming from the west and you wanted to make an easy transfer to another extension? Why not propose relocating the station that's on Third Avenue in Jefferson and again, bring it in into more of the core part of downtown and allowing for an easy transfer from Jefferson onto Central or to First Avenue and Jefferson, Washington. And so the final piece as we again started thinking more and more about this and allowing was the piece coming in from Central City South and South Phoenix was adding a station for individuals coming from that part of our extension and giving them the same opportunity to be able to transfer to any part of our system. So with that in mind, and this next slide kind of shows um, to scale how our trains would line up to these platforms. And so what this really allows for, again, is it allows a benefit for the through traffic on Jefferson and Washington for individuals that are exiting Cityscape Garage or the Renaissance Garage. But the other piece is from the light rail passenger's perspective is that they'll now be able to come into this new type of a transfer hub and be able to get to any extension that they would need to simply by walking across the street. This also relieves some of the pressure of forcing every extension to go up North Central Avenue, which is a really good thing for the auto going between downtown and Camelback. And the final piece to this is from the uh, bus perspective. Right now, a lot of our express and rapid buses do pick up passengers right in the city co cityscape complex underneath the pedestrian bridge there. And with a mixture of auto traffic and bus traffic in the morning commute, as well as in the afternoon commute, it does get a little uh, busy in that area. So as a part of this uh, uh, modification, it also ties in with the uh, downtown transportation plan 
which called for the removal of automobiles between Central and Washington on Central Avenue and making that a transit core. And so this would be transport to public transit on the Central Avenue side. And then in working with uh, Ray's team, and I know planning development's working on improvements on First Street, that would be a place which is one block over. They're gonna now have two lanes northbound, which would allow for the auto vehicles to utilize that. And so the final piece to this is that from the community's perspective, and I know you all are very familiar with the look of our current light rail stations, we've got a lot of infrastructure on there. And we've really done that because there's, there's a methodology behind having a kit of parts and keeping your station standard. However, as you start looking around the country, not every station has to look the same, especially when you're in sensitive areas and really cool historic buildings in downtown, et cetera, that we don't have to have a one size fits all. So as we started looking around the country, this is an example in Portland, Oregon, and what you see in front of you is an actual light rail station. Not much infrastructure there. They've got lots of trees. They've got buildings right next to it. Obviously, this doesn't disturb the, uh, the look of the buildings or block the view of the buildings. If you look towards the far back part of it, there's a canopy back there for those that would like additional shade. And really, all it takes is making a grade change to the sidewalk by 14 inches, which allows for us to have the level boarding, which is very important to us for our passengers, especially our passengers uh, are from an ADA perspective. So that's an example in Portland. An another example that we wanted to show you from Portland shows more of their downtown area where they have some historic buildings. Again, not much infrastructure for the actual station outside of making a grade change to the uh, sidewalk to allow that easy boarding onto the train. So that's all fine and dandy because they're doing it in Portland, but we wanted to make sure that we gave you an example of what it could look like if we did something in, in Phoenix. So. This view here in front of you is if you were standing right outside the CVS on First Avenue in Jefferson, looking to the southeast towards Central in Jefferson. So right now we currently have light rail tracks in this stretch of road along Jefferson Street. There's a concrete island there, which is the foundation for the uh, signal pole. So for this particular station, for example, if we were to add a similar type station, and this is just for, uh, for you to con for consideration, not a final design by any means, but just more of a visual. We could add a station similar to something like this that doesn't have the same um, type of infrastructure that our current system has, offering some shade there on the far eastern part of the platform, but definitely not something that would impact the, the look and the, the nice characteristics of the Lures building. Uh, we could drop in some trees, for example, for additional train, or I'm sorry, additional shade. And then of course, with the uh, addition of a light rail system, we expect to be having more people in the area, getting off and on the train or in the area. And then of course, when you start adding people to an area, hopefully you start becoming more vibrant and lights turn on and you've got more businesses and small shops. And so this is really just one example of, of, of what this could look like on one corner and we'd like to replicate that on the other corners. Um, so when we zoom back out of this, this, uh, this kind of shows what we would propose, which is the relocation of the two stations from 3rd Avenue in Washington, 3rd Avenue in Jefferson, and moving those into the cityscape complex, as well as adding in a station as a part of the South Central extension there on Central between Jefferson and Washington to be able to add the connectivity for residents in that area. And then from a mobility uh, standpoint, uh, flexibility for, for light rail on 5th Street and 3rd Avenue would be putting in single tracks there. So that way, uh, on today's system, because we do have one-way couplets. If there ever is an incident on any of our one-way couplets, or if there ever is a need to block off any of those couplets, we don't have the ability to cross over. So maintaining operations in the core downtown area becomes very challenging from a light rail perspective. We're oftentimes having to uh, work with Mar Maria's staff from doing bus bridging, which is definitely a, a fix, but it's definitely a, becomes a much more complex operation. So that would uh, be also a part of this recommendation to be able to offer some more flexibility from a multimodal perspective. And um, from the uh, public input, we have been working this uh, through some of the uh, stakeholders in the immediate area. We had one-on-one -on -one meetings with Red Development, as well as with the uh, ownership from the Renaissance Building. And then we met with downtown stakeholders from downtown Phoenix at, at their board as well as we went to a quarterly meeting with the Phoenix Community Alliance. Uh, last night, I had the opportunity to share this uh, vision with the Central City Village Planning Committee, as well as several other businesses. And, and the long short of it is we've had 
overwhelming support and, and they like the idea that we're putting this vision together. Obviously, each one of these stakeholders come at it from a unique perspective and they wanna be a part of the, the process as we further advance these plans. But from a vision standpoint, they completely understand the fact that we wanna make sure that we have easy transfers for passengers, uh, like the idea of having a, a, a 24 seven vibrant city with lots of people moving around, wanna make sure that everything is, is safe and, and, and it's actually something from a red development, they were specifically excited about supporting the commercial uses and the office space that they have in the area. So, so far we've had some, some really good, good comments uh, from the stakeholders in the area. And uh, next steps going forward, if this vision moves uh, and gets has support of the council is that we would continue working with our partners at, at Valley Metro and their consultants on advancing these, uh, these design concepts. Of course, as a federally funded project, we would work with the FT on their coordination. And then anything that they would need us to recommend on adjustments into the design and any kind of proper documents that we would need, we would move those forward in coordination with the Federal Transit Administration. So um, the previous action, we did go to the uh, Citizen Transportation Commission and we did get approval on August 31st from the uh, Transportation Commission on this, on this plan for downtown. And so with that, um, staff would like to recommend for the subcommittee to recommend approval of the downtown light rail track and station configurations, which would include adding track between on Washington between 1st and Central Avenue, as well as shifting two stations from 3rd Avenue into the uh, cityscape complex, and then the adding of a station between Central and Washington, and then of course the uh, tracks on 5th Street and 3rd Avenue. And with that, I'd be uh, happy to answer any questions. And thank you for your patience, as I know that is a, a lot of information. So. <laughs> I don't think I've ever heard you talk that long before. <laughs> I had a glass of water before. <laughs> do you have any questions? I do. Okay, go ahead. Thank you. I think it's great that we're planning ahead and trying to think about what the system will look like as we build it out. Um, one of the things we've talked a lot about is how people really prefer one-seat rides. They would rather not transfer. So it, does this system maximize our opportunity in the future if we do have ridership that would allow, say, someone to go from South Central all the way to the airport, would we be able to? Yeah, so Chair Williams and, and Councilwoman uh, uh, Gallego, we, we do have that flexibility, so we still have the ability, to, we would have to work with operations. Uh, we actually got that question from um, some individuals uh, from, uh, representing uh, Arizona State University, as right now their, their students have a one seat ride between campus to campus, and so we would simply work with our operations and being able to offer different, uh, a lot are different uh, A train, B train, et cetera, that would say this train would actually allow you to go from downtown campus up to the uh, Tempe campus, as well as if you wanted to continue to uh, the state capitol, and or, or if you were in the central city south or south Phoenix area, we would have to work with operations to say, you know, we've got one line that would take you from central and baseline area up to Metro Center Mall. Uh, we do currently show on the design a, a right turn that would go from north central on to east Washington, so that is a part of the final design. Um, what this really is highlighting is just wanting to offer the ability that as the system expands, we know that transfers will probably become a reality depending on the multiple places people want to go. And so in the event when people do need to make a transfer, we want to make sure that those transfers are as seamless as possible, but then still having the flexibility to work with our operations to incorporate as many one seat rides as we can as a part of the system. Great. And it looks like there's just with the physical space constraints, there's not the ability to do like a direct transfer onto a bus line or anything like that. Where the bus pulls up, doors open, go directly from light rail. Uh, Chair Williams and, and, and Councilman Gallego, so we still would have, and, and, and Maria can expand on this, we still have the two light rail stations at Central Station. So if an individual wanted to go and do a multimodal transfer from a light rail to bus, they would just go one station up to get to the First Avenue, Central Avenue, and Van Buren to connect in with all of our major bus lines coming in to Central Station. But I think one cool benefit that we'll have is that if an individual wants to make a train to train transfer, they would utilize the hub on Central Washington Jefferson. But if they wanted to make a multimodal transfer from bus to rail, we still have the flexibility that we have that type of a transfer at our central station, which our existing central station, which is two, one light rail station to the north, which is a couple minutes away. Right. And will you talk a little bit more about what Central Avenue would look like in the cityscape area? So uh, uh, Chair Williams, Councilman Gallego, the alignment for, for the South Central extension would remain the same. We're not making any changes to that. So Central Avenue, as a part of the downtown comprehensive plan that was adopted by council, I believe in 2014, 
um, did call for as a part of the introduction of South Central that uh, vehicle traffic would no longer exist between Jefferson and Washington on Central Avenue, that it would be more of a public transit type corridor. So you would see uh, train and bus utilizing the same guideway, as well as lots of flexibility for PED to be able to utilize that space. We know that that block between the two cityscape building is highly used for foot traffic, as well as for special events, um, holiday type special events. So we want to make sure that our design is, is complementing and being able to support those events, because that's the whole idea behind this plan is that when we introduce a station there and as we make more investments in transportation that we continue to support that. So that would be the, the, the difference in, in, in how this design as far as uh, no auto vehicle would be on that one block. So I'm just going to interject on this. So when we met with Red and talked about this, um, so by having the light rail station as well as the buses use the same platform, um, hugging the um, left side or the east side of the road on Central Avenue, that then frees up the remaining lanes for pedestrians, for special events, for any other um, type of way of, of engaging the site that Red would like to use um, that, right. that area. So that, they actually saw that as a, as a big advantage. And also having the buses share that lane, it then frees up the traffic um, over on First Street. So we won't have our buses mixing in and adding any more congestion. So it's more of a free flow for cars who are either entering or leaving downtown. I represent the, much of the warehouse district just south of downtown, and Central is an important, uh, particularly <clears throat> in the evening, during commuting hours, that connectivity with the car traffic. And so we're thinking, where will we think the traffic will be displaced to, the car traffic? Sure, uh, sure will you? Chair Williams and uh, Councilwoman Gallego. So that's the based on the transportation comprehensive plan that we have. We do have uh, a connection that we would di divert traffic. Uh, I believe it's either north or south of the, the, the railroad uh, area, uh, where we have going east and west, just south of the, the downtown. So we do have connectivity going up to First Street, where we would have two lanes, as was mentioned, two lanes going northbound and, and one lane going southbound. So it's right around the, the warehouse district area where we would divert traffic, uh, more traffic to have uh, the ability to uh, go through the downtown area. So you still have um, the uh, vehicular traffic going up to Jefferson. It's just between Jefferson and Washington is going to be uh, a more of a transit, public transit corridor. But we'll have a diversion of more traffic going off of uh, First Street. OK, because we are trying to get more connectivity between the downtown and the warehouse district. And obviously, this will help a lot with the transit side, but we just still have m multiple modes there. Um, I realize we're not anywhere near final design, but in terms of pavement markings, what are we thinking we would see? I mean, it was something where, like, airport, you'll, you'll be, like, something on pavement where you know where to walk between the stations if you're doing a transfer. Uh, Chair Williams and, and Councilman Gallego, I mean, those are all ideas that we want to and obviously we'll take, that's all good recommendations because we are uh, going to be getting the final design on this. Right now we're in conceptual. And so, uh, for example, when we had meetings with the uh, Phoenix Community Alliance multimodal uh, subcommittee, they want to be a major part of what types of, whether it's wayfinding or marking and making sure that as we have all this vibrancy, which is positive, we want to make sure that it's safe from, in multiple levels. So those are going to be things that we would be working out in the final design, whether to make sure that it's safe markings, making sure that we're working with the race team from the signalization perspective, uh, making sure we're working with Valley Metro as far as that we're putting in engineering standards that make sure that the commutes are safe for people to get to and from stations or from the light rail to work or to their businesses. So all of those comments, it's, it's actually ideal timing to take those suggestions so we can incorporate that stuff into the final design. And it would be great to reach out to some of the hotels to understand what, how their visitors move about. So maybe the Downtown Phoenix Partnership would be another good Absolutely. That's group a great of stakeholders. Suggestion. Thank you. Um, Vice Mayor, do you have any questions? I do. I have several questions. Okay. Um, my first question is, uh, what traffic considerations have you thought of out of developing this re reconfiguration? Okay. We can't hardly hear you. Just a second. Okay. Um, here are my three questions. Um, what traffic considerations have you thought of out of developing this reconfiguration? And have you used... Um, have you utilized any simulations and pattern models and doing a timing and flow of 
uh, efficient arrangement, specifically when the ballpark leaves, uh, Phoenix Suns, or anything happening in the convention center all at one time in concerts. And then the third one is um, what measures are you taking for future security concerns into account? And how will they be deployed? And where is the funding coming from? Albert, I think you're probably the one to answer most of that. Yeah. Uh, Chair Williams and, and Vice Mayor Pastor, those are all uh, great questions. And so I'll, uh, I'll introduce some of uh, the, the traffic uh, piece to, to one of your questions. And then Ray can probably expand on that. Uh, but at a high level, in working with street transportation, they were that was a major consideration. And you make a very good point because we do have lots of major events in downtown as well as lots of convention centers. And so um, as a part of this design, by eliminating the, um, the 90 degree turns by the train uh, and working with street transportation, the, the flow of east-west on Jefferson and Washington will hopefully help to improve because Jefferson and Washington are major uh, streets to allow uh, vehicle traffic to come into those events as well as being able to exit. And then in regards to the traffic simulations, which really ties into to your question, uh, we have uh, built into the contract with Valley Metro and their consultants that once this uh, vision is, is approved, uh, one of the first action items will be to run traffic simulation modeling. So that way we can look at the existing design that we have and then test that against the proposed in an effort to make sure that whatever the result is is something that is the more efficient option to be able to not only move trains but also we have to make sure that we are efficiently moving vehicles into the area because we know that vehicle traffic will still be a major part of people being able to access all of the events in downtown and then from a security perspective, again, that is a, a great point. So safety and security and passenger experience is, is a major concern from a light rail perspective as well as a city perspective. And so some of the ideas that we've talked about and, and worked with Valley Metro, and they've been very, um, ve very uh, willing to, to work with us, is establishing very visual locations for security kiosks on all of these blocks where we're going to be introducing new stations, making sure that we have adequate, adequate safety and security personnel during our times of operation to make sure that our public um, can be able to see those personnel and make sure that if anything happens that they have someone available to be able to respond, as well as uh, running these, these plans with our transit enforcement unit. So that way, as again, we're adding all of these stations and activities, we need to make sure that we have the appropriate security personnel and investments to, to, to be able to implement that. And then from the investment piece of it, obviously our, our uh, light rail portion of the T2050 would be a key part of the funding to be able to add these additional resources, um, just like we've had to do in, um, in the recent past um, along our existing system as safety and security, to your point, rightfully so, is, um, is at the forefront of any of the transit investments that we're doing, whether it be on light rail or bus. Madam Chair, just to add also, uh, when we were developing the uh, 2014, what got approved for the Comprehensive Downtown Transportation Plan, we actually worked uh, with partnership with the uh, Maricopa Association of Governments. So they also were a part of that. They funded that, that study, but also had uh, some expertise on the modeling aspects of it and how the downtown was going to be uh, functioning. So uh, in collaboration with the team, the current team, we're working with MAG to make sure that we're using the up-to-date modeling aspects of the downtown transportation so we have good numbers to to validate what we've come up with in 2014 and then make any uh, additional modifications with regards to this uh, design that that uh, that we're moving forward with valley metro okay because i do have great concern about this in the sense of moving traffic and moving people in and out i know that uh staff looks towards the future and anticipating that more people are going to be using light rail, but the pains of the growth is now and the frustration is now. And so um, I would just on a side would like to see all the flow and the simulations of how it's going to be moving. Um, the other piece was, as I heard, uh, and I'm, Correct me if I'm wrong. I heard something about the Third Avenue station. Can somebody uh, remind me of that? Uh, possibly moving. Yeah. So Chair Williams and, and Vice Mayor Pastor, as a part of this plan, the the existing plans, if if this if this 
uh, presentation wasn't here today. The current plan shows for stations that were part of the extension out to the state capitol to have stations at Third Avenue, Washington area, as well as Third Avenue and Jefferson area. So uh, staff's recommendation as a part of this plan would be to relocate those stations from the Third Avenue area to the First Avenue, Jefferson, Washington area, which allows for us to have this transfer hub around the cityscape complex. So have you worked with the downtown code on this? So uh, Chair Williams and, and Vice Mayor, we haven't uh, worked with the, uh, from the downtown code perspective. Um, we are, we do have a light rail planner on board, but we haven't, from a downtown code, we haven't visited with them, but we'd be happy to, to work with them on any uh, questions or concerns that would, would be a part of uh, the relocation of the light rail stations. Well, I think that you, uh, you're going to need to go back and look at that because if you read the downtown code, it's very specific um, and, tell, and st to stating uh, what is expected in the downtown code. But that's in the transportation area. I, I think Ray would probably know that. Um, my other question is, uh, Washington and Jefferson, are those are there plans in the future to make them two-way streets? Sorry, uh, Vice Mayor, I, I didn't catch, uh, capture the, uh, the statement. I'm sorry. What streets were you saying? Washington and Jefferson. Washington. So at this point, um, right now, the plan, based on the transportation comprehensive plan that we have, we still are going to keep those as one-way streets. Uh, but the main goal is to keep three lanes in each direction. So uh, Washington would have three lanes going uh, westbound and three lanes going on uh, uh, eastbound for Jefferson. So that, that would be the the the... the the ultimate goal for that. Uh, there's some combinations right now, but uh, in consideration with light rail, consideration with bike lanes, uh, the goal would be to keep three lanes in each direction for that, for those, for those corridors. Do you have any further questions? Are you there? <laughs> I have the feeling we just lost her. Are you here? Yeah, I don't know. Somebody was calling in and knocked me out. <laughs> oh, you panicked us for a second there. Do you have any further questions? That's it. Okay. Uh, most of my questions have already been asked, but I do. Is supposed to be funded as a separate project? I mean, I know we've already done the South Central and the Northwest funded amount, submitted the numbers, so this will be a third one. So, uh, Chair Williams, so this, this item actually doesn't require any additional funding from the City of Phoenix. The, the funding that we've already approved as a part of the South Central Extension, which was the $50 million for final design and pre-construction, is funding that is adequate enough to, to, for these design modifications. So we no longer, we're not requiring any additional funding as a part of these design modifications. That's amazing. Okay. Yeah. Very good. Uh, if we have no further questions, I think this is posted for action. Uh, does anyone want to make a motion? Move approval. Okay, I will second that. All in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Aye. Motion carries unanimously. Okay. Um, that takes us to the next, the 2050 Bus Rapid Transit Program. And Albert, I think that's you too. So Chair Williams, members of the subcommittee, uh, Again, we are very excited as a part of um, the, the, the voter approved uh, Phoenix Transportation 2050. Uh, one of the elements uh, of that plan was the addition for a, a new uh, transit technology, a transit mode within the Phoenix area, which is by no means a, a new mode across the country, but something that, uh, that we had added to the ballot and, and that the, uh, the, the voters did again approve. And so what we're looking at is, is this bus rapid transit. And we know that this is something new to the Phoenix area and something that we have to be very patient upon and, and be very, um, uh, from an education perspective with our community. And so as a part of that, one of the key steps was we needed to bring in 
staff at the appropriate level that had lots of background on implementing and working on these types of systems and really how they can make sure that when we do something like this that we do it in the right way and that we make sure that we build consensus and make sure that we make the investments of this type of transit in the right areas. And so um, with that, I'd like to, to introduce Mike James, who we uh, stole back. He was in the Phoenix metro area for a while and then left for a few years out to the city of Seattle where he had lots of experience working on many modes of transportation, but lots of great experience on successfully implementing a bus rapid transit system in the city of Seattle. So with that, I'd like to introduce Mike to uh, go through a presentation and staff's recommendation, then we'll be happy to have any questions after. Very good, thank you. Thank you, Albert. Uh, thank you, members of the subcommittee. So what we'd like to do today is really provide an overview of bus rapid transit. As Albert said, this is a new technology. Um, we'll also introduce some great um, insight and comments that we got from the CTC, Citizens Transportation um, Commission. And then we'll be requesting your approval to issue an RFQ to begin this work and select a qualified consultant teams to really develop with us in our community the bus rapid transit program. So what I wanted to focus on being kind of the first presentation uh, before you is what is it going to take to be successful with this program? So the first thing that we're going to look at to be successful is really delivering a service that's more focused on saving time and being more efficient and providing um, more mobility choices for our growing population. So we're going to be looking at ways where we can improve the run times of our buses. We're going to be looking at ways that we can reduce the dwell times of our buses when it's picking up people and, and moving through intersections. And we're going to be looking at ways that we can make it easier for people to pay and board those buses and making our overall system um, work better with our existing light rail spines and our other high capacity transit um, networks. So the second thing that we are looking to do to be successful is really provide a strong return on our investment. And this is really an investment in our community. So we know that to get a strong return, we need to listen to that community, really understand as we're implementing this new mode, this new technology, this new service, what are their highest and most needs? And as you see the, the, the network that we're working on, those needs are going to be different throughout the city. So we're going to have to have a strong focus in listening to those unique communities throughout the city to really fine tune um, the service that's put in place so that we can achieve high ridership, um, good efficiency for our bus network so that that efficiency can go to cost savings for not just that BRT service, but for the other local services that, can, that are going to have the benefits of the investments that are made in, that, in those transit corridors. The last thing that's really exciting is we're going to operate the buses here like we've never done before. We're going to look at uh, promoting and implementing a frequency-based system where we can keep those buses um, focused on headways um, that really connect more seamlessly with light rail. And we can provide that service um, in the ways that the communities need. We've heard just in talking to different people throughout the, the community, even before kicking off this program, is um, in some places we'd like later night service, more connections to the airport, and other things like that. So we can really listen again and tailor these new services to what the community is looking to and as we implement the program. So one of the things that's been interesting in talking to other staff at City Hall is uh, there's some confusion about our existing rapid service. Um, as you know, rapid is our uh, commuter-based freeway point-to-point -point system. That's not really BRT. What we're looking at for BRT is really making those transit investments in our arterial network um, not so much a system that runs on the freeway HOV lane. So one thing that we're, we're pretty sure of as we look to the branding and the naming of this system, we're going to want to use something that doesn't use the name RAPID in it. So we would avoid that confusion in the future. So why is BRT great for Phoenix? I think the, the thing that we have to start with is looking at our light rail system. We know that light rails provide economic development um, and community um, advantages for those people and those businesses that it serves, but not everybody lives in close proximity to light rail. And light rail doesn't always take you where you need to, to go. 
So this is an opportunity where we can expand our frequent bus network throughout the city and really provide that the higher level, more premium service to many more of our residents. You know, BRT also provides us the opportunity to introduce high capacity transit where light rail might not be fitting with the context of the neighborhood or the community or where other engineering or constraints would be just too disruptive to those communities. The other thing about BRT is we can implement them um, faster and at a lower cost than the, traditionally we've done with light rail. Um, the last point that I'd make is not all of our corridors really have the density to support light rail in a cost-effective way. And that way we can implement BRT and then as the system in the city grows, we can scale up the service as what it needs to be. You can see here on the map the T2050 um, identified six corridors um, for, for us in the network. We need to look at um, early work looking at identifying either the 19th Avenue or 35th Avenue corridor. Um, we also have identified Baseline, Thomas Road, 24th Street, and Bell. So that is really our network that we'll be, that we'll be working on. So why else is um, bus rapid transit really good for Phoenix? Um, if you look at where we are economically, you know, we've gone through the Great Recession, which is in a lot of ways devalued some of our larger commercial shopping areas. Um, we've seen a technology boom where a lot more purchases are moving online. BRT really gives us the ability to move a lot more people and promote housing and mixed-use development that really supports where we need to grow as a, the fastest growing city looking to add you know, 700,000 people over the next 20 to 30 years. So really does support that economic reinvestment um, in, in these corridors. Uh, the other note that I would just say is that BRT really is a benefit to those existing businesses because it can bring more people, more foot traffic that can use the existing businesses and, and, and also promotes a sense of pride. Um, you know, in the last city where I worked, if you said, well, I live on the rapid ride line, that meant something. That meant that you didn't have to wait long for a bus. It was always going to be there around the clock. And it was just a reliable part of your life. Um, another thing that's happened across the country in America is as we've implemented local bus service and express bus service like we have here and rapid service like we've done in Phoenix, a lot of the inner city neighborhoods don't have the same frequent or express connections to the major activity centers. This bus rapid transit program really gives us an opportunity to provide that access to many neighborhoods that really don't have that fast and frequent service. Lastly, one of the great things about bus rapid transit is it easily integrates with the neighborhoods and it's, we're using tools that people are familiar with. It's a bus, we're looking at bus shelters, we're looking at streetscape improvements, um, crosswalks, all things people really understand um, and fit within their existing context. So in looking to release the RFQ, we really got four key pieces of work. And it's really focused on a, the community aspect and then the technical work that will follow that. As you can see in the, the diagram here, the most important and significant aspect of this work for us to be successful is how we work with the community, how we educate them on what this program is and can be, and the engagement with them throughout the entire process. So in addition to that work, we have some planning and implementation work that we need to do up front. Um, we need to look at and assess the corridors that were chosen and make sure that we're making the investments in the right place. We need to develop our goals and objectives, our performance me metrics. Probably most important is develop a funding and finance plan so that we can show you how we want to roll this program out over the next 30 years. The next piece is really the capital system development. That's all the pieces of BRT that make the system work. Everything from the branding, the naming, the colors, the, the signal and transit priority equipment, the stations, real-time information, all the pieces that, that combine to make up this new system. Once we've done those pieces, then we will be 
moving on to the um, preliminary engineering final design to deliver those, those, those pieces. So back uh, on August 31st, uh, a couple weeks ago, we did get a recommendation from the CTC to move forward. They also asked that in this initial planning that we assess the corridors and make sure that we're making the, the right transit investments for our city. So that's a key piece of the initial planning work that we're going to be doing. Now looking back through the T2050 process to get to these corridors, you know, we looked at kind of the key things that you look at in transit. Are we serving, you know, the major population, employment, the disability community? Are we serving minorities? Um, we look at the geographic coverage of the city. Are we making sure that when you layer on bus rapid transit in addition to our light rail corridors, do we have good coverage throughout the city? Do we make good connections with light rail on the local bus? Are we serving those major activity centers um, as well as the existing ridership? So those are, those are the things that we'll look at as we uh, move this program forward. I want to ask a quick question. On, you just talked about sharing. Are you, what you've not made clear is this is a separate system from the current bus operation that we have, right? How will you... Yes. Uh, distinguish between the buses we have now and the new buses. I mean, are you talking different shelters, different uh, color schemes? Yes. Yeah, so as far as the um, capital system development, the implementation planning, one, the first thing we really need to do is identify what type of operation is this going to be. And there's really kind of two directions that it can go. Um, and it depends, the, the right service is really going to depend on what's the right fit for the area that it's serving. Um, bus rapid transit could be an overlay service where it's totally separate buses, totally separate stations, or it could be integrated along with the local bus service as just one branded corridor. So those are some of the decisions that we need to make as we're starting the, the planning and the evaluation of this network. Okay, so all you're asking for today is to go into the planning process. Is that correct? Yes, yeah, so Chair Williams, so this is really step one. So what all we're asking for today is uh, the approval for City Council to allow staff to issue the RFQ. So that way we can begin doing a deeper dive into to all of these questions, and really this is step one. And then once the work begins with the consulting team, we would be coming back to the commission as well as to the council with updates as we move through these initial steps so that way we can look at everything from branding, from the signal technology, what would the buses look like, uh, we're making sure that we're making the right bus rapid transit investments throughout the city in the right area. So and this the is cost. true. And the cost and the schedule. Um, we really didn't identify any schedules for any of these corridors because we know that the first step is to make sure that we better understand the dynamics of the corridor so that way we can then be in a better position to start looking at schedule and cost. So, so again, this is, this is merely step one to simply issue the RFQ so that way we can begin the, the work on the bus rapid transit program. Thank you. Do you have any questions? I do. Thank you. This summer I had the opportunity to visit some BRT corridors under construction and in operation in other communities. I feel like we do still also need an education component for our community because it is substantively different than the system mm -hmm. we have right now. A dedicated bus lane will have very different economic impacts. It will have very different impacts on our street operations. So I would love to see us partner with institutions like Arizona State University and, and others to really educate our community. What is BRT? What has it done in other communities? How is it different from the bus system? How is it different from the light rail system? Because before we go out and start talking to people about whether they want this in their corridors, they need to understand what it is. Mm -hmm. And I think we're, we're at the point where we ought to maybe take, uh, create opportunities for our media to go out and just show with the camera what does it look like in Seattle when we have BRT um, to be able to describe what's done for those communities and what it hasn't done. Because there are a lot of people who I talk to about BRT who think it is the rapid system. And it is very different. So I don't know that this consultant necessarily is the one who needs to do that general education. We need a great consultant who has the technical capability to build a good system for us. But I think our community is not there yet with understanding what is bus rapid transit. Yeah, we agree. In fact, um, we, as part of this um, RFQ, we will be including um, consultants to engage in community education and engagement. So that will be part of this work. And we will bring back an inclusive 
outreach and education program so you can see how we are strategizing to work with the community throughout the entire city. Yeah, and Chair Williams and Councilwoman Gallego, that's a great suggestion. And we can definitely incorporate utilizing our, our resources that we have here now that are locally known, like Arizona State University and others that could also just be another layer of resources to really take the appropriate time to educate all populations in our community about what this system is. So that way they can then truly have some effective engagement with us as we move the program. So great, great suggestions. If you talk to some of the students who are in planning programs here, they don't, they haven't learned yet about bus rapid transit, maybe just because it's not in our market right now. Right. I think our real estate community is not familiar with it as well, unless they've lived in another community. So we, we gotta get the planners, the real estate folks, the homeowners, the people who care about Absolutely. So the, again, the Chair Williams and Council Gallego, those are great, great recommendations. Those are things that we can definitely fold in as a part of this process that could be parallel efforts um, as we move forward with, with, you know, with the RFQ. But those are all great suggestions because there's just lots of different population groups in our, in our community that we're going to have to educate. This is very similar to when we first started introducing light rail into our community back in, you know, in the early 2000s about what it is, what does it look like, what are the impacts. Um, sometimes it involves uh, either photos from other places or sometimes even field trips to other places. But but absolutely, the education piece is the critical initial step in this whole process. Absolutely. It would be great to move forward as well with understanding the technical side. We have picked some complicated corridors in right. very important areas of our city. Yeah. We're sure, going to challenge some engineers. Absolutely, because as we do begin the process, naturally um, the questions from the community will start to become much more specific and want much more examples. And so to your point, um, parallel to this, to bring on the technical resources as well will help us to be able to respond quickly to those questions as they come up. Uh, Vice Mayor, did you have questions? I do, I do. So I concur with uh, Councilwoman Gallego. Uh, there is a lot of, nobody knows what BRT is, and then when you talk about BRT, um, there's a little bit of unfamiliar as to what does that mean and what does that mean to the street. Uh, the other piece is, is that I was reading on page 51 of 55, item 13, that I want to make sure that uh, the CTC recommendation is included in this uh, motion. Um, so uh, that's a question to Albert, is this part is this part of the request of adding that work should be also included in assessment of the information used to identify specified BRT orders to ensure previous conditions considered still valid for current and future systems? Is uh, that part of this too? Chair Williams and Vice Mayor Pastor, absolutely. The, the CTC's recommendation um, is a part of this recommendation for the work, absolutely. Okay, all right. So I move a motion. Uh, okay, so you're making a motion to approve? Yes. Including the CTC's recommendation. I believe yes. you have a question and I do have a card. Wonderful, and I also just wanted to recognize Tom Remus who has been working with, as we build the 202 to integrate BRT because it does connect with one of our likely future BRT corridors. So I think it's important that people know we are working across areas of the city to make sure as we build that this whole system works together. So thank you to Tom for that particular leadership, and I second the motion. Okay, uh, before we vote on it, Stacy Champion. You, you 14. Want, oh, 14. I was gonna give her an advance. <laughs> uh, okay, uh, we have a motion, we have a second. All in favor, please say aye. 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 Uh, opposed, motion carries. Well, telling me, I should have looked at the next one. It's recycling. Of course, Stacy would be here. <laughs> uh, Phoenix Diversion and Recycling Programs Update. I think I'm the one that asked for this to see how we're going. Yes, It was sure, a little bit did. controversial a year or so ago, and uh, you've made great progress, and I think everybody needs to know what's up. Yes, so Chair Will Woman Williams and members of the subcommittee, um, Ginger Spencer, Public Works Director, and thank you for this opportunity to come and give you an update on how we're doing with progressing towards our goal for Reimagine Phoenix. Uh, here with me, I have Deputy Directors Jesse Duarte and Brandy Barrett, and then also one of the newest members of our team, Lucas Mariacher. Um, so, Reimagine Phoenix is our goal um, to achieve a 40% diversion from the landfill by the year 2020. 
And so we, uh, mayor and city council, established this goal back in 2013. Um, the whole concept was is that we would focus on new programs and services to residents, um, that we would educate our residents and do a lot of outreach in the community on what is and what isn't recyclable, and then also that we would actually create public-private partnerships. And so as a part of today's presentation, what we want to focus on is what we've done as a city to lead by example. Um, Jesse and I have worked very closely with city uh, department directors over the last year um, to get a handle on what they're doing and making sure that we are accounting for it in our reimagined Phoenix goal. Um, and then also we've increased our um, efforts in how we actually promote recycling in City Hall um, and in the downtown area. And that was um, a suggestion that also came from Vice Mayor Pastor as well. Um, and so really that's what we're here today. Um, and then also we have our partnership with the Recycle Bank program. So we're going to provide you an update on those areas. Jesse. So, as Ginger said earlier, uh, working with other departments. So, just not just trash and recycling, we're doing that you see inside the, the buildings and everything. But we also look at other areas of diversion. Uh, we also work with all the other departments, such as uh, Public Works, Water Department, Streets Department, NSD, Aviation, Convention Center and our housing department as well. And we've done special events, as you know, like the final four. Uh, some of the items outside the realm of what we're talking about internally, we, we track with them is we do a lot of metal recycling and a lot of green waste recycling for these departments and also plastics. One of the things that we've done with the water biosolids is they divert about 130,000 tons a year for land application for farming. So that's really good for us as well. Aviation, aviation, what they do uh, they actually have their new administration building. If you've been out there, it's actually a zero waste building. So it's, it's pretty good. Anything zero waste is anything 90% or better that they divert out of that building. So the other two things that they do or other things that they do, aviation and the convention center, they're doing food waste. So we've been working with them on food waste diversion from them. As you can see, our, we've also worked with, uh, we've partnered with Parks Department, ASU and us, to go ahead and do a three-year turf study. And so far to date, in the two years that we've been doing this, we've got about 759 cubic yards of, of mulch that we've been able to transfer to the parks. The other thing, if you look at our eco stations, I like those, those are, they, they, they're working out pretty well for us. And so far, we've got nine locations, uh, nine containers in nine locations, uh, one in each district, and then one for the mayor, which is over at Hans Park. So far, we've diverted about 82 tons of recycling out of, that, out of those uh, nine locations with about a 2% contamination rate, which is really great. What we're seeing coming out of these uh, eco stations is a lot of cardboard. A lot of cardboard's going in there and aluminum. Uh, so, but our specialists actually go out and inspect them every morning to make sure what we're seeing coming out of there. And then, of course, our housing department. Housing department is a great partner to work with. We've, uh, about a month ago, we implemented recycling over at Sidney P. Osborne and Lou Crone apartment complexes that they own. And uh, we're moving forward with them. Um, we actually went out there and worked with the housing department. We did a walk and talk, made sure that all the residents knew what was going on. And then we delivered the in-home containers to the property management, which they will then in turn deliver them to the residents. And then we delivered the containers. So it's been about a month. We're, we're evaluating the process as we go through. We inspect the containers twice a week on Tuesdays and Fridays, and then they're, I mean, on Tuesdays and Thursdays, and then they're uh, serviced on Fridays. And with that, I'll pass it over to Brandy. Thank you, Jesse. Chairwoman Williams, members of the subcommittee, I'm pleased to be able to provide this update on the Recycle Bank program. Um, as you recall, our public facing program launched fully uh, to the public on January 31st of this year. Um, Phoenix residents are able to join, whoops, pardon me, I went one ahead. Uh, they're able to join for free at RecycleBank.com and they can earn incentives and rewards for learning how to recycle more and recycle right in Phoenix and for even recycling in their blue bins. Um, you may also remember this is a program that we're able to offer the public by identifying existing savings in our current budget, so no additional appropriations to provide this program. So over the past nearly eight months, uh, right alongside of Public Works, a Recycle Bank has gone out and engaged the community we serve by participating at select community events, and as the weather cools, is ramping up efforts uh, to do additional door-to-door -door campaigns to engage uh, our, res uh, our residents, especially in the areas where we are seeing a need for improvement in waste diversion. 
Additional ongoing citywide education and engagement includes direct mail and email campaigns, as well as social media. And uh, we, Recycle Bank has focused specifically on making sure we're um, outreaching to our Spanish-speaking community. And that's included segments and mentions on a number of Spanish media outlets, including Univision, La Voz, Arizona, and Telemundo, Arizona, among others. So I'm also excited to share that Recycle Bank has recently upgraded their app. Uh, and that's been upgraded to promote additional sustainable uh, and reward options. So for example, now, if you recycle at any of our eco stations, when you go and do that, you can check in on your app and get points for recycling there. It's a really exciting uh, and innovative um, improvement. And it can be used in a lot of different uh, ways as we move forward. Um, also, the Recycle Bank partnership has really helped the city gain an even better understanding of the perceptions and priorities of our customers, as well as the composition of our waste and recycling streams through surveys and waste characterization studies. For example, we know uh, through a qualitative, excuse me, a quantitative study of Phoenix residents that 97% of the folks who were surveyed believe that recycling is beneficial to the community, and 96 believe, 96% believe that it makes good economic sense for the community. However, uh, only 63% say that they feel knowledgeable about recycling. So we see an opportunity for improvement in that area. Uh, also last spring, Recycle Bank conducted a household level waste characterization study. And that was really designed to get a better idea about what, what's going on at the household level in terms of curbside recycling behaviors. And the study came back very interesting findings. And these are things that we kind of, we knew because we see it. But to have the actual data to support it is extremely helpful. So we learned that there were, were some significant contamination issues. And one example is plastic bags and bagged recyclables. So 38% of all the samples they took uh, of recycling were they had bagged materials and that's a problem because as you know those plastic bags they're not recyclable in the blue barrel program and they can actually get caught up in the mechanisms at our material recovery facilities cause damage to the equipment and even stop operations um, so we're really keen on getting those plastic bags out of the recycling bin uh, and out of the waste stream and, and we're continuing to work with our partnership with the Arizona Food Marketing Association on the Bag Central Station and improving that uh, opportunities to recycle soft plastic there, um, but also we again we see another opportunity for additional education around this issue. I think when you were in my office, you told me that so many people were participating in recycling, but they were putting them in the plastic bags and then putting them in the barrel, which is a problem because you can't recycle. That all has to go to the landfill. Yeah, that's that correct, correct, Councilwoman. Um, yes, that is correct. So it's just not somebody throwing a bag in; they're throwing a loaded bag in, that's right. thinking they're helping and they're not. That's correct. And what we would like to see them do is just to put the loose recyclables straight into the bin. Um, and so they can do that by lining their, bin, their inside the house bin and dumping out the loose recyclables into the blue bin, or, or there are other alternatives as well. But yes, that's a very important point. Thank you, Chair Williams. So the data gathered through these surveys and studies is really going to help us identify key opportunities to increase our diversion, optimize our educational efforts, do more community outreach, and identify areas for development and public-private partnerships. So in short, we're really looking to leverage this data to help us um, optimize how we move forward in achieving our 40% diversion by 2020 goal. So our next slide is Recycle Bank by the numbers. So this is the current data through July 31st. Um, and before I proceed, I'd like to recognize Recycle Bank, Recycle Bank Executive Vice President Paul Wynn and his team who are here today for their work uh, and partnership on this program. Uh, as you can see, nearly 40,000 Recycle Bank Phoenix members have participated in more than 134,000 educational transactions. That includes reading articles and taking other sustainable actions. Uh, and members have already redeemed nearly 19,000 rewards from both local and national partners. Uh, those partners are including Joe Bot Coffee, Bed Bath & Beyond, Target, and uh, Duck & Decanter are a few examples. Um, so now I'm extremely pleased to have the privilege to introduce to you one of the newest members of our public works team, Zero Waste Coordinator Lucas Mariocker, to my right. Uh, Lucas is the city's face of recycling, um, and he manages a team of zero waste specialists who go out into the public and do proactive education about how to recycle more and recycle right in Phoenix. Um, Lucas joined the team a little bit more than a year ago, and he's already had a significant impact on our diversion uh, efforts. And um, so I'm pleased to introduce him to this body and turn the presentation over him uh, to him to discuss our diversion-related efforts in the downtown area. Chair Williams, members of the subcommittee, um, thank you and good morning. Thank you, Brandy, for that kind introduction. And thank you to the management team for allowing me to present today. 
Um, I have a brief presentation, uh, three focus areas I'm gonna focus on infrastructure updates on City Hall and Kelvin Good Building. Um, prompts, specifically visual prompts to help educate and also education in general. Um, so, with, oh, excuse me, without further ado, um, a new program we introduced uh, in City Hall and Kelvin Good is Zero Waste Stations. If you don't know what a zero waste station is, it's essentially a larger bin that has five streams. So you can actually put a variety of different materials that you can't put in your normal recycling bin. So this was actually a recommendation from a member of the subcommittee, which we're really happy to implement this. Um, we have three separate streams. So we have recycling, trash, and the three new streams, which are cartridges and in -car or toners, um, batteries. So any household batteries you can recycle if you work here and also soft plastic. So any of those grocery bags that we have problems with in our bins, um, soft plastic, Ziploc bags, bubble wrap, that stuff is recyclable, just not in your regular recycling bin. So we have three of these right now. We have two in City Hall, one on the first floor right when you exit the employee entrance, excuse me, and then one on the 10th floor as you enter the cafeteria. And the other one is actually located at Calvin Good as you exit the employee entrance. And then along with that, we have infrastructures specifically for the employees um, in all conference rooms, kitchens, common areas, we have new bins. Uh, we're really trying to standardize what we're doing here in City Hall and then our long-term goal is actually to roll this out at other facilities. Right now we're focusing on the two in, um, downtown buildings and as you can see we have new bins, they're all color-coded um, and I, we're really excited about the one in the middle there. Um, we have what we call micro bins. Um, we've had uh, actually over 200 employees in the past three weeks um, request these bins, they just come to our floor. All they have to do is actually return their old trash can which they've been happy to do because those are extremely old and they get a smaller bin. So you actually, how it works is you should attach it to your recycling bin. And the theory behind this is that you actually reduce what you're consuming if you have a smaller bin. Um, so that is a new program we just rolled out three weeks ago. And then the second component is visual prompts. So a visual prompt is essentially um, a measure to in, um, inspire some sort of behavior change. So we're hoping that with new bin labels, again, color coded with pictures and text, that will not only increase recycling, but um, reduce contamination and re make recycling easy. Because a lot of things I hear in the community is, oh, I don't know what to recycle or this, I don't know where to put this. And, and my goal is to reduce that um, confusion. So hopefully we're doing that with these labels. Um, oh, and back to infrastructure real quick. Uh, in partnership with the Downtown Phoenix Inc. and uh, Community and Economic Development, um, we rolled out big belly containers. Uh, this is what we call them in the industry. Um, essentially, they are solar powered compactors. So the cool thing about these things, they actually send live updates to our staff to let them know the bins are full. Um, two goals with this is to increase efficiency and also reduce truck travel time. So we will be studying these over the next year to make sure they're actually doing what they say they're doing. We have 15 of these locations. Um, they are located from Washington to Monroe and Third Avenue to Seventh Street. And then finally, uh, education. So. Um, I have a few things, uh, new things my team and I, and along with our public works department, have been working on. Um, to start off, facility tabling. So a lot of these new programs we roll out, we like to educate before we do it. So we're working on tabling downstairs in the buildings where we incorporate these changes, and also um, Phoenix Connect articles, as well as we're working on an internal program to educate um, online with city staff as well. And then departmental training. So departmental training is extremely important to me. It's something that I worked on a lot at ASU. I think it's very important not only to roll out changes, but to make sure your um, departments are educated as well. So we have currently educated three departments. We're training human resources this morning. Actually, I, was, I couldn't make it. And then we have water departments scheduled in the next three weeks just to talk about all the stuff we're doing and, and educate on all the new programs. And then finally, which you guys are, should be happy about, is our new competitions. So this past uh, March, we had a, what we call Recycle Madness. So in conjunction or very similar to um, March Madness NCAA basketball. We had a five-week competition. Uh, we seated all the floors in um, City Hall, one through 19, and we had a competition, five-week competition. Um, and as you can see, the city mayor and the um, council offices won. They did excellent. Um, so this is something in conjunction with the green team, the sustainability team, uh, we implemented. It was a program. It wasn't my idea. I will not take credit for it, but we got it off the ground and it happened. And um, it was very inspiring to see the engagement on the, the staff level at this. Um, so. Are the you good... kidding? It was almost deadly on that floor. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Chair Williams and members of the committee. Pretty competitive. I, will, I wasn't going to mention that. It did get very competitive, um, so thanks for bringing that up. It was very exciting to see the engagement. And actually, through the five weeks, we saw an increase in recycling, specifically on your floor. We took over 30 bags in the last week of the competition. But we also see, which is most important, a reduction in contamination. So I wanted to thank you guys for that. And uh, we look forward to 
changing the rules a little bit for next year, but doing it next year as well. So. Oh, I, oh I, I'm worried. Everybody's going to start saving now after hearing that. But uh, that concludes my portion of the presentation. Thank you. So just a little friendly competition <laughs> to get folks excited about recycling. Um, so Chairwoman and, and subcommittee members, we want to thank you for your leadership in, in, in putting this challenge before us to achieve a 40% diversion by the year 2020. So hopefully from today's presentation, what you've seen is from, through our combined efforts of working with our solid waste customers and working with city departments and leading by example, and then just our new partnerships, right? Programs, new programs and partnerships. Um, we are happy to announce today <laughs> Uh, that we have achieved a 30% diversion for the year 1617. So uh, we are working hard <laughs> uh, to move that needle. Uh, we know we have a very ambitious goal, um, but our men and women of Public Works and all city departments and our partnerships, we are working very hard to help us get there. And then we, as we know, and we're not stopping there, um, in April, Mayor and City Council approved a zero waste goal for us mm -hmm. by the year 2050. So. We're going to continue to work hard at this, um, but we are pleased to um, announce our progress to date. Thank you. And we're very pleased to hear this, too. I believe Councilman Valenzuela joined us. Is that correct? Yeah. Yes, I have. Thank you. And uh, I apologize for being late, Madam Chair. Do you have any questions about uh, our recycling? Uh, I don't. Okay. Uh, Vice Mayor, are you still there? No. No, I don't. Okay. Thank you. And I might have a, a few questions, but I'd love to hear the card first. Okay. Stacy Champion. Uh, good morning, Stacy Champion. Good, thank you, Councilwoman Williams and Councilwoman Gallego, Chair Williams. Um, I was hoping today to hear an update um, with regard to I believe it was at the May policy meeting um, about with regard to multifamily housing. They promised me next month. I was also hoping yeah. to hear that. Yeah. So um, oh. very close. So I was just I was I was curious, I guess, about that versus having any other statements to make. Good job, good job, everyone. Thank you. Um, but but hoping hoping that there was quicker movement happening on that Hopefully front. Hopefully that'll be on next month's agenda. Is it, is it one in three Phoenix residents lives in an apartment? Is that the statistic? Um, Chairwoman Williams and subcommittee members and, and Stacy Champion, that is correct. And we have been working very closely over the summer uh, with Jake Henman as well as the Arizona Multifamily uh, Association, Multi-Housing Association. So we look forward to coming forward in October uh, with our results there. And then we've also been working and surveying residents as well um, to get feedback on that, as well as working with haulers. So um, we're going to bring that forward in October. So oh, come back in October. Yeah, I hear great news. I will be here. OK, thank you. Council Levin? Thank you. I was, uh, the, I've gotten great feedback on the eco stations. People really like them. It was something that we'd heard demand for quite a while. and. People remember when we used to have more options. 3% uh, contamination rate is wonderful. That's phenomenal. Maybe we've found the, the real key. That so. is correct. Yeah, I almost cautioned Jesse about sharing that number because it's so good. <laughs> um, but the eco stations have been going very, very well. Our staff are doing a wonderful job. That was one of the ideas that came from Jesse Duarte and his team. And I shared a story recently where I was on a function for an arts event. And a person met me um, from the arts community and asked what I did. And I said, Public Works Director, where we do recycling and diversion. And she said, I love the eco stations. I didn't even mention eco stations. She said, I love the eco stations. And so I said, which one do you use? And she said, the one at Indian Steel Park. So that's going very, very well. So thank you for that. Wonderful. So it seems like we're getting very good numbers, especially for a community that does a voluntary programs. Um, Chairwoman Williams and Councilwoman Gallego, thank you for mentioning that. Everything that we do is on a voluntary basis. So 
even when we were at 20%, that number was impressive. And definitely now that we've moved to 30%, it's great. A lot of cities where they're um, beyond the national average of you know 35%, they have mandates, fees, and fines. So everything we're doing here in the city of Phoenix is on a voluntary basis. And that speaks to your leadership as well as our residents. So thank you for mentioning that. I love that it's part of our brand in the city of Phoenix when we do mega events, our new diversion programs are front and center. When we're doing business attraction and business growth, we have so many businesses that are part of the recycling economy. On the Recycle Bank sign, I really like when we partner with our local businesses. So it was, I was thrilled to see as I walked into Joe Bot, uh, the Recycle Bank sign. I haven't seen as much of that lately, but it would be great to do more with our local businesses because they can be ambassadors for us as well. Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, I think that was it for me. Thank you. Okay. Uh, this is a non-action item, it was informational only, but I want you to thank all your staff for all their efforts because we are making great progress. It seems like uh, we've just turned the switch on and people are getting on board and I think the more education we do, because people still say, I don't know what to recycle. So it, it's going to be a continuing education process for us, but you're doing a great job, and I just want to thank all of you for all your hard efforts. Thank you so much. Appreciate okay. it. Uh, call to the public. Do we have any cards? Okay, I'm calling. I don't hear anybody. Uh, future agenda items. Anyone have anything they want to add on future agenda? Hearing none, we stand adjourned.